for you to lead us out of Babylon. For I was just a boy when I came here. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise and bring you back to this land. Who are you, old man? I am Daniel. I seek to tell you a story. A tale of four kings. One great, one foolish, one who was deceived, and one who is destined to be regarded as wise for all the ages of the world to come. Marxism is based on division. When we review its history, we find the primary method of divisiveness lodges itself in separating working class people. They use the modality of oppressing the oppressed. The leaders against their leaders, politicians against citizens, all to motivate the poor to hate the wealthy. Today, the exploited divide is revealed in racial disputes, sexual identity, and social welfare dependence. All you have to do is look at the daily news. Fact, lazy people do not want to work, let alone fulfill what the scripture says. Just looking in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 11, it says, for we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Our bottom line regarding socialism or Marxism is that you don't want to work for your food and housing. The leaders say, no problem. Our government will take from the rich and give to the poor. That begs the question. Who is the government calling rich? The answer, all those who work for a living. This kind of stinky thinking turns a nation into lazy spoiled children who demand of those who work for their pleasantries. Leaders like Nebuchadnezzar hold the golden key to enslaving the weak to build their empires of wealth. The curious thing about Marxism, the people at the top become wealthy through the efforts of the slaves that serve them. Therefore, Marxism, socialism, and like-minded empirical systems are built on slavery. For this is the exact system Nebuchadnezzar used to dominate the world. Today we're on number six, Failure of the Wise Men. In this episode, we will discover the difference between spiritualists who were possessed by demons sold to Satan and who could communicate with evil spirits from the other side versus that of divine wisdom of God. We will detail how Nebuchadnezzar revealed his spiritualists as fakes and what he decides to do with them. I'm afraid this political trajectory in Nebuchadnezzar's governance is more than just a method used during his time. Prophecy reveals that the system launched a trend that has dominated governments throughout all established nations to this very hour. In our modern times, we call this systemic shift Marxism or Socialism. Solomon once said, There is nothing new under the sun. His statement alone became prophetic. Satan is predictable. The system Nebuchadnezzar used was so effective because it was birthed through the demonic wise men that surrounded his throne. That same spirit of the Antichrist has not changed in form appearance, or modalities. What worked for Satan with Nebuchadnezzar 
works for modern leaders. And in our summary, God never changes, nor does Satan. Let's review our scripture. We encourage you to study Daniel chapter 2, 1 through 49. However, today we're going to focus on verses 4 through 12. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Arabic, O king, live forever. Tell the dream to your servants, and we will declare the interpretation. The king replied to the Chaldeans, The command from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream in its interpretation, you'll be torn limb from limb, and your houses will be made a rubbish heap. But if you declare the dream and its interpretation, you will receive from me the gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore declare to me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time and said, Let the king tell the dream to his servants, and we will declare the interpretation. The king replied, I know for certain that you are bargaining for time, inasmuch you have seen that the command from me is firm, that if you do not make the dream known to me, there is only one decree for you. For you have agreed together to speak lying and corrupt words before me until the situation changed. Therefore tell me the dream that I may know that you can declare to me and its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is no man on earth who could declare the matter for the king, inasmuch as no great king or ruler has ever asked anything like this of any magician, conjurer, or Chaldean. Moreover, the thing which the king demands is difficult. There is no one else who could declare it to the king except gods, whose dwelling place is not with mortal flesh. Because of this, the king became indignant and very furious and gave orders to destroy all the wise men in Babylon. Looking at be wise or die. Now in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar became desperate as to the interpretation of his dreams. Wherewith his spirit was troubled and his insomnia was driving him to the edge. Then the king commanded to call the magicians, astrologers, sorcerers, and Chaldeans, who were philosophers to show him the meaning of his dream. So they came, they stood before the king, and the king said unto them, I've dreamt a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. So the Chaldeans spoke to the king. However, the scriptures we just reviewed, this scene did not play out as the wise men expected. In verse 5, the king told the philosophers if they did not make known the meaning, they would be torn limb from limb, and their houses would be burned and made rubbish. As a good measure, he told them that if their wisdom brought accurate interpretation, each would be blessed with many gifts. With that, he told them to give it their best shot. Then, the king speaks of their excuses of not being able to interpret the dream. Expectantly, this did not sit well with the king. Since Nebuchadnezzar was far wiser than the wise men, he perceives that these men were bargaining for a time due to the fear of losing their lives. He levels them with, For you have agreed together, to speak lying and corrupt words before me until the situation is changed. Now that the philosophers were caught in their plot, the king turns up the heat, only to result in a statement that leads them to their death, saying, There is not a man on earth who could declare the matter for the king, inasmuch as no great king or ruler 
has ever asked anything like this of any magician, conjurer, or philosopher. Well, from my chair, this is a perfect setup for Daniel. After being enraged by the lies and plotting of his supposed wise men, he immediately ordered to have them killed, as well as all the wise men in Babylon, including Daniel and his friends. Nothing like overreacting. Looking at the king's bodyguards seek to kill Daniel. After the king put forth his orders, the king's guardsmen set out to destroy all who were a part of the wise council of Nebuchadnezzar. When they found Daniel, Arioch announced the king's orders. By way of his wisdom, Daniel responds with discretion and discernment by requesting time with the king and declaring the interpretation of the king's dream. Permission was granted for the following day. Now looking at God reveals the king's dream, after Daniel granted permission to visit with the king, he first took off to the home of his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, to inform them of the matter. He knew that this task could not be without compassion, wisdom, and revelation of their God. He also knew that if God's insight did not flow through him, he and his friends would die with the rest of the wise men in Babylon. With that, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. Keep in mind that Daniel had not heard the king's dream as of yet. This reveals yet another supernatural occurrence of God. Daniel comes out of the vision with a grateful heart filled with praise unto his God. He certainly knew his humble state. Without question, Daniel proclaims, Let the name of God be blessed forever and ever. For wisdom and power belong to him. It is he who changes the times and the epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. It is he who reveals the profound and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. Now firm in his beliefs and faith, Daniel went to the king's bodyguard and announced he could interpret the king's dream. Arioch hurried to the king stating he had found a man among the exiles of Judah who could make the interpretation known to the king. Daniel is invited in. Looking at the king tests Daniel. After the king asked Daniel if he could interpret his dream, Daniel reinforces what the king's wise men said. Basically, no human can interpret his dream. However, Daniel didn't stop there. Daniel knows this is the appointed time to transition the king from gods to God. He says this, However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in latter days. Now, Daniel has the attention of the king. Daniel affirms that the Lord thy God has given the king the greatest revelation beyond all leaders, a dream that reveals the future. Not only that, the dream came from the king of kings and the God over all gods. What Daniel is about to reveal next is the binding glue that will connect Daniel to the living God of the universe and beyond. Daniel 2.30 says, But as for me, this mystery has not been revealed to me for any wisdom residing in me, more than any other living man, but for the purpose of making the interpretation known to the king, and that you may understand the thoughts of your mind. 
With that, the king accepts Daniel as a confidant and advisor. In conclusion, Daniel set himself apart by not taking personal credit for the dream's interpretation, which was not the case with the king's demonic wise men. In doing so, he can introduce the king to the most powerful nation in the world, to the most powerful source in the universe, who happened to be the god of the people Nebuchadnezzar enslaved. Speaking of a wake-up call, most kings remain cautious of men that serve them, fully knowing most, if not all, are seeking self-credit for ideas, wisdom, or service. Not Daniel. He forwards the credit to God for the interpretation, understanding, and the godological logic of his dream. Through Daniel handling the king wisely, Nebuchadnezzar bypassed Daniel and was put before the living God. And for doing that, Daniel won the king's heart as his most faithful and beloved servant. Coming up next in number seven, interpretation of the dream. Daniel gives full satisfaction to King Nebuchadnezzar concerning his dream and its interpretation. The king showed great kindness and acceptance to this 19-year-old prophet. In fact, we see the start of a loyal friendship between the two. The king had invested much in Daniel's maintenance and education. He had invested three years of bringing Daniel up in the school of Babylon. Yet this young man's wisdom rose above the wisest in all of Babylon. And now, the king is abundantly encouraged by his investment. However, Nebuchadnezzar is about to see that Daniel's wisdom was not his own, but rather from a God who is above all other gods. Though Daniel was not a named prophet, he was given a prophet's reward, the dependence of a king who cherished his every word. Stay with us as we unfold the holy interpretation of a wicked king's dream. Until next time.